And I'm, I'm at a place in my life right now where I'm just charging hell with a water gun every stinking day of my life. And, and I haven't gotten over it because I'm not trying to get over it. It's not emotional. It's intentional. I've had an encounter with the love of God, and it has wrecked my daily behavior. My believing has brought me into a deeper becoming, and my behaving is simply a byproduct of that. I had a nice theological conversation with some people while I was in Israel, and they were like, well, your, your behavior's got to change. I said, it will. When you understand that you are the righteousness of God and, and, and you, you're at the finish line, not the start line. When you said yes to Jesus, it was the finish line. You were completely made righteous by Jesus in the sight of God. And you are as holy as Jesus is right now in this moment. You are never going to be any more loved and holy than you are right now. If you said yes to Jesus, well, how come my behavior hadn't changed? Because you're becoming the fullness of a thing. Well, how does that happen? By the renewing of your mind through the washing of the Word. Amen. The Word will tell you that you're healed, delivered, made whole in every area of your life. Even when your body's not manifesting healing, the Bible will say you're healed. Even when your bank account's not manifesting prosperity, the Bible says you lack nothing. <laughs> See, when your, belie when, you, when your believing starts to get deeper than just Sunday morning uh, uh, chill bumps, when your believing starts to impact every area of your life and, and you start to get deeper in this thing called righteousness, that he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. When we, uh, of, of God in Christ, uh, when we start to dive deeply into what that righteousness is, we are the finished product right now in spite of the behavioral things that we're still dealing with. But you haven't gotten to that part of your believing yet because you're still learning what happened to you when you said yes to Jesus. It was more than fire insurance. It was more than just getting out of hell for free card. It was healing, deliverance, made whole in every area of your life. You lack nothing even when the body says you might be. When you understand the fullness of the righteousness of God, trying harder and doing better is no longer a part of your life's equation. I should be further along by now. You are as far as, far along as you're ever going to be in your spirit, man. But your believing is maturing. And you're becoming everything you already are in this natural body. Because the body's only going to manifest what the brain or the spirit tells it to do. Amen. And so as, as your believing begins to mature, your becoming begins to deepen. Behaving is the last thing that happens. If you're saved, you ought to act like it. Give me a minute. We have people in this church that are leading ministries that when they got saved, they still dealt with addiction. They still dealt with stuff. But because God be delivered them totally at the point they said yes, the minute their brain hit the same pace as their spirit, they got totally set free from every addiction. And now they're leading addiction ministries to teach people how to get, addic uh, how to get free from addiction. Most churches would have kicked them out and said, go get saved and come back when you're, when you're living right. I'm just telling you what, mo this thing, look, you're in a house of grace, you're in a place of love and mercy, and I don't care what you're dealing with right now, God figured in our stupidity. When we said yes to him, he figured in all the junk in the trunk, and he said, I'm going to use them anyway. And when you start to dive deeply into the thing you already are, try harder, get better, will, will be eliminated out of your daily motivation for life. Because you already are the beloved daughter and son of God.
Your beloved identity is who you are. I might pastor a church, but that's not my identity. I might be a songwriter or recording artist. That's not my identity. I might be a husband and a father, but that's not my identity. I am a son of the Most High God who hears his voice, who operates in his authority, and who walks in his favor. That's who I am. Even in those days when I don't feel like that I am, I am by faith. I am the beloved. Son of God, somebody say amen. And in those moments when the adversary comes and you do stupid because we all do, you know what stupid is, it's knowing better and doing it anyway. If you don't do stupid, you're dead. We all do stupid. I've laid hands on people in the prayer line here. They went out in the spirit and flipped me off in the parking lot because I cut them off on the way out of church. Stupid. It didn't impact their righteousness, though, in the sight of God. Oh, I'm preaching really good right now. I promise you I am. Amen. 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 And so when we get to that place where we are who he says we are and we believe it, then we start saying things that he says we can say in confidence. And when you say what he says you can say, you'll start to see what he says you can see. Oh, man, I'm, I, this is so good right now. I'm telling you, my, my spirit, man, I feel like I could blow up an onion sack right about now just, and just let it go. For those of you that don't know, you can't blow up an onion sack. Go to the store back when you could and look at an onion sack. There's onions falling out of the holes. You can't blow one up. You know, a joke is bad when you have to explain it. <laughs> Welcome back, Pastor T. Yeah, you'll get it on the way home. Whoever said that, you've been listening to me preach a long time. It's a Polaroid. It takes a second to develop. You will get it, I promise. Praise God. So I'm standing there, and we're, we're, we're in the valley of a very famous Bible story in 1 Samuel 17. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to teach it to you right now. Is this okay? We're standing there, and I'm looking to my left. It's the armies of Saul. That's where they would have been. You come down through the valley and you're looking 40 miles this way is Jerusalem. And on this hill over here would have been the armies of the Philistines. And every day for 40 days and 40 nights, a man named Goliath, somebody say Goliath. Goliath. He is a physical manifestation of a demonic thing in the earth realm called a Nephilim. It's the fallen angels having sex with women of the earth, giving birth to giants. That's a Nephilim. Goliath is a Philistine. He's from a place called Gath. Somebody say Gath. Now somebody else touch your neighbor and say, you don't say Gath, it's Goth. Say Goth. It's Goth. So this Philistine walks out every day and he's mocking the Israelite army. No one's coming forward. No one's coming forward. This little redhead boy, been taking care of sheep on the backside of the desert, gets an instruction from his daddy Jesse, who's a Bethlehemite. Somebody say Bethlehemite. Say he's from Bethlehem. You got to get this because these are these are details, really good details. His daddy says, David, I want you to get some cheese and crackers together and run this down here to your brothers. Now, it's not just like walking from one end of our building to the next. We're talking miles. When you go to Israel, I hope some of y'all get to go with us sometime. Uh, when you go to Israel, you will see just how far things are. It's all together, but it's really, really far. You, you don't get there. and It's not like getting in a car and you're, you're driving and then you're there in five minutes. You've you got to have a made-up mind to walk where you're going. So David comes, he brings the cheese and the crackers to his brother, and this, this, this giant, Goliath, is mocking the armies of God. And, 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 and David, he's not on Facebook, so he didn't get the, uh, the Facebook Live of what's going on. He says, who's that? And why is he talking about us like that? Who's he think he is? 
and, and they, they explained to him why they were afraid because he's, he, this dude's nine, ten feet tall. His, his spear, just the shaft of his spear, is 17 pounds. And the spearhead itself is, is about 16 pounds. It's roughly 13, 14 feet tall. His body armor weighs almost 700 pounds. Goliath's head inside of his helmet is 125 pounds. David is five feet tall, maybe five five, about the size of Marcia. He might weigh 150 pounds. See it? And and David, David's like, who's who's this guy, and why y'all afraid? Trembling in their armor. David's like, so what do we get if we take him out? Well, you get to marry the king's daughter and you're, you're living tax-free and debt-free for the rest of your life. He says, I'm in. <laughs> Teenage kid. Been on the backside. Take care of sheep. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> David, 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 David. You're, you're the cheese and crackers guy. And David's like, oh, no, you don't understand. I've been taking care of sheep back here. Uh, there was a bear that came into my flock, and I killed that dude <laughs> with my bare hands. And then a lion came in, and I grabbed that thing by the beard. Who's this guy? Okay, you want to do this, David? Put on the armor. So he puts on everybody else's armor. You'll never walk in the fullness of who you are trying to wear somebody else's anointing. Oh, I could stay here in camp all day, but there's a giant down here that needs whipping. David puts on the armor. He's trying to do it right because he, he's subjecting to his leadership, and, and, and he's trying to put on somebody else's armor, and he's like, I can't flow. I can't move the way I need to move in your armor. David was appointed, or excuse me, he was anointed king by Samuel when he was a young man maybe 10, 12 years old. But there's a difference between the anointing and the appointing. So while he's in the process, that's the time between the anointing and the appointing. That time span is called process. He's writing in his, in his personal time, he's writing Torah. And, and, and that's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to know. And, he, and when, he, when, when he's writing through Torah and, he, and, and he's taking a break and he puts that Torah in his bag and, and he's, got that, he's got that shepherd's bag close to him and, and, and they finally, he finally talks Saul and to let me go down here and handle this problem for you. They're trying to talk him out of it. So what, what does David do? Now, we all know the story. We have this thing in our brain where David just runs down from the mountain, and he's going as fast as he can, and he's slinging, and he's swinging, and he's slinging, and he's swinging, and he's got the, whoo, and yeah, here he comes. Here, no, there's a conversation that takes place between David and Goliath. Goliath overlooks David and says, do you think I'm just some kind of dog? Have you, are, you, are you insulting me right now? He says, I'm going I'm to kill this dude and give his body to the birds and the animals. And David's like, oh, you come to me with your spear and your sword. And what he didn't know, what he didn't know is that David went down to the brook, and I stood in that brook this past week. And he picked up five smooth stones. And guess where he put them? He put those five smooth stones in the same pouch where the Torah was. See, if you're going to do anything, you better mix it with some word. Man, I want to stay here. <laughs> and he picked up five smooth stones. That creek bed, that river bed has millions of them in there. I picked up five smooth stones myself when I was there. And they were only about this big around. Why five? Because Goliath had four brothers. Oh, we can spiritualize it. Oh, it's a number of grace. 
No, the practicality of it is I'm going to kill him, and then if you boys jump in, I'm killing you. That's where David's brain is right now. He's delivered the lion into my hand. He's delivered the bear into my hand. And he's going to deliver you, you uncircumcised Philistine. You come against the armies of God. I am coming to you in the name of the Lord. And he reached in there as he was reaching for that stone. He no doubt had to, he had to get into the word. Y'all seeing this right now? Goliath, check this out. Goliath's helmet is from here all the way around. We know the story. David slings the stone and hits Goliath the only place that he could, right here. If you watch the movies, they now have, this, this story is so famous that Goliath's helmet stopped right here. Goliath hit him here, or David hit him here. But from that moment on, they started making helmets where they come all the way down, the protection come all the way. Why is that? Because you just never know who God's going to raise up and going to make you cross your eyes. The stone hits him. Goliath falls down. And David reached over and grabbed. He's standing on top of Goliath. The sword almost weighs as much as he does. And he pulls that sword out. See, he already done spoke a thing. And now he's walking in the thing that he spoke. He's been spending time in the word. God done delivered him from, hey, I got a feeling there's some other people in this room. God's already delivered you from your bear and from your lion and this new thing you're facing. You're entering in with so much confidence right now that you can't even believe the adversary's trying again. And he reaches down and he grabs Goliath's sword and he cuts his head off. I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 17, by the way. I'm somewhere in the middle of the chapter. And he cuts his head off. How much does his head weigh? 125 pounds inside that helmet. And, and Saul's like, what did you do? And, 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 and he reached down and he grabbed that, 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 uh, uh, that head and that helmet and he went before Saul. Saul needed to get a report. While they're doing that, the Philistine army is now afraid. Their giant leader is dead. They just saw him get beheaded by a five-foot guy weighing 150 pounds. They take off running. Saul's army is following close behind. They're about to wipe out the Philistine army. He's now, David is standing before Saul. David will become famous because of what he did for, for the nation of Israel. Because of what God did through him. And Saul will become jealous of David's fame, eventually. But in this moment, David's standing there with the head of Goliath in the helmet. He's 150 pounds and he's holding 125. But it doesn't stop there. The Bible says that Goliath took that 125-pound head and he marched it to Jerusalem. 40 miles away by foot. Didn't put it in a wagon, didn't load it on a horse. He went to Jerusalem. 150 pounds carrying 125. 40 miles. So when they name you, oh, I got to get to the point. When they named you, they named you Goliath's name is Gaul, G-O-L, and he's from Gath, Gaul, and he's from Gath, or if you're in Israel, he is from Goth. This is Gaul from Goth. David carried that head all the way back to Jerusalem, and he buried it in a place 
and he called it Gaul Gotha. <laughs> David took the head. I'm going to say it till you get it because I'm going to preach in a minute. Carried that 125 pound head all the way to Jerusalem and he buried it in a place and he called it Gaul Gotha. Which translated means place of the skull. I'm about, to, I'm about to blow away your old rugged cross theology because there was not three little crosses on top of the hill. But where was Jesus crucified? Your Bible says that another lineage of the line of David. See, David took out the physical manifestation of a demonic attack that hit the earth realm. And he buried his head at a place called Golgotha. But then another line of David came. You'll hear the blind man's calling out his name. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And we've got Jesus. Where was he born? Where was he born? Where was he born? I know he lived in Nazareth, but where was he born? Where was he born? Where was, where was, Jess, uh, where was Jesse, David's daddy? Where was he from? He was a Bethlehemite. Y'all stay with me right here. So God raised up a David to take out the physical manifestation of a demonic manifestation in the earth called the Nephilim. The giants. And then God raised up his own self and manifested him in the name of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, and took out every spiritual giant in your life that you will ever face. David buried the head there. And if you'll look at Matthew, you'll see all these different Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all call it the same place. Some call it Golgotha. Some call it uh, 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 the place of the skull. We in the Christian realm, uh, the Latin word is, is uh, 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 Calvary. And this is where we get, uh, uh, it, the, the English word is Calvary, but it all means the same. It's the place of the skull. David took care of the physical thing. Jesus came and took care of the spiritual thing. And it was all done right there at Golgotha. Woo! Do you see it? Golgotha. And when you get there, you will see that I've got a picture. Uh, I took a picture of this place. Media team, do we have that? Blow it up. Look at there. That's from my camera on my phone. Can you see the two eyes? The nose is missing over time. It, it's felt, but that's, that looks like a skull. And in, 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 in your theology, you were taught that there were three crosses on top of that hill. On a hill far away. Slow down. It wasn't on the hill. The Romans were masters at psychological warfare. What you don't see, and I edited it out, in front of this place, there used to be a, a garbage dump, a pile, a heap. Now, it's a bus company where they park their buses. You don't see it, I edited it out. But right there, right in front of the bus company is the road where they would have crucified these thieves, the Romans would have, at eye level. So you could hear them groaning. You could see them bleeding. You could hear their agony. You could hear them suffocating to death because the Romans wanted to make sure that if you are a would-be criminal, this is what's coming to you. They're masters of psychology. And they, Jesus would have been hanging in the place of the skull. Not on it, in front of it. That's where he was. The same place they believe, they believe it was the same place David buried the head of Goliath at a place called Gaul from Gath. 
Goliath from Gatha. You put them together, and it's Golgotha. This is a powerful thing. God didn't do anything by accident. He did everything on purpose. Why? Because he knew, he knew that there needed to be a, I'm going to also tell you something that Jesus did. Jesus came and he was the personification of grace. Everything in the natural realm, Jesus won it for the kingdom. He destroyed sickness, disease. He, de he destroyed sin. For those of us who said yes to Jesus, it's more than just a religious experience where we just come to church and we spend 30 or 40 minutes together and we get three points in a poem and we go home. This is a life changing thing that when we said yes to Jesus he opened the door to the kingdom of God and we now decree and declare that the kingdoms of this world are his and we are a part of that kingdom reassignment look I'm telling you all of heaven is waiting for us to take our place to prepare the earth for the kingdom because they want to come back and rule and reign with him I believe that you and I are alive for such a time as this so that we can remind the adversary Every time he brings up something in our past, we'll take him back to Golgotha. Every time he reminds us of something that we're going through right now, just a few hundred yards uh, this way from Golgotha, you will see the garden tomb. And I've been there, and I report good news today. He's not there. Jesus is alive and well. The tomb is empty. Our king is alive, and he's coming again. Hallelujah. Glory! And he's not coming back as some wimpy blues despair, gloom despair, agony on me. He's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we will bow and worship him, but there will be others who will bow and worship him. And I'm going to rule and reign with him. I've made up my mind. I am no longer going to live beneath my birthright. My, 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 my. This is a powerful thing, isn't it? Powerful. You think it was a mistake that Jesus was crucified at Golgotha? Isn't this powerful? Isn't this amazing? God didn't make any mistakes. No accidents. You're not a failure. You only are a failure if you quit. If you fall down a thousand times, get up a thousand and one. Don't know how many times Jesus stumbled on, the, on his way to that place. And he could have called it quits, but he looked ahead and said, Tony needs me. I take it personal. And he gets up, and every step was for me. And when he died on that cross, I died on that cross. And when he got up on the third day, glory to God, I got up on the third day. And now that same power that raised him from the grave is living in me. Hallelujah. Glory! Don't quit. Don't give up. I don't care how big your giant is. I don't care how loud he's yelling and talking through you. Don't you quit. You remember where God brought you from. David said he brought me from the bear and he brought me from the lion and I'm still here and he's going to deliver me from you. Whatever you need. Here's what you need to do. You need to start talking to the thing and instead of about the thing. Your Bible declared that at that place right there, Jesus was hanging on the cross. And he rendered, he, <laughs> he satisfied the handwriting of the law right there. And on that cross, in front of that place of the skull, he rendered your adversary powerless. <laughs> Do you know who you are? I mean, do you know down deep in you know her who you are, daughter of God, son of God? Do you know, do you know, do you know? If you don't know, you better ask somebody. How many of y'all remember that commercial on TV? I'm dating myself right about now. Here's what I, I hope we get to a place where we don't have to ask anybody. Hope we get to a place where you just know who you are. 
Not because a preacher told you, but because you've been in the book yourself. This is my Bible. Uh, you, you've been in the book yourself. You know who you are. You believe everything daddy said about you. You are to die for. You are above only and not beneath. You are blessed coming in and going out. Everything you touch is for the kingdom. Everything God has placed inside of you, it's not an accident. You might be living through some valleys right now. You might be living through some giant experiences right now. But I have got good news. You are not not dead yet. God's got a purpose for you. And that resurrection power that raised Jesus from the grave, the minute you said yes to Jesus, that power hit your life and every demonic influence has to bow at the name of Jesus. It has to go at the name of Jesus. We cancel that assignment from the adversary and we replace it with the things of God. Everything in the kingdom belongs to you in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout to the Lord. Everything in the kingdom is yours. Everything in the kingdom is yours. Woo. And you can't take it from me. Well, I don't know if I like it all. Right, you get in the kingdom, start living in kingdom abundance. He's got kingdom favor. He's got kingdom resources. He's got kingdom promotion. When you live your life according to the kingdom of God, your mind gets blown on a daily basis. You start getting back into self-effort, you'll be as depressed as you can be because you, by yourself, you'll never make God happy. And the minute you try to get back into that self-effort, you have fallen from grace. God doesn't want you in that place where you're trying to make him happy. He's trying to get you to the place where you realize he thinks you are to die for right now. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing. Yes, amen. I wish we all could come as little kids and just believe what daddy is saying. Oh. I talk to my little boy every night on FaceTime or almost every night. Nana's cell phone's not quite there yet, so we just have to talk on the phone. Nana, I love you. But when I could talk to Drew, I saw him here, and we were communicating, but there was nothing like when I walked through the door and that little boy come running up them stairs from Nana's house, and he said, Daddy's home, and he grabbed me and he kissed me. There's something about Father when you feel like he's so far away from you. And by the way, I was there uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles, and you ought to see them Jewish people dance. I mean, they were doing it till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, celebrating that God had accepted the atonement. And they were partying for eight stinking days, and I slept through six of them. comes running up the stairs and he's hugging me and kissing me and I thought man this must be what God feels like every time I make time to come running out of whatever I'm in and just go and hug and kiss him and love on him and you know what I just I said dude what do you want a horse a house a motorcycle what what do you because he didn't he didn't ask me for anything he just came to love on me man I'm at a place in my life, I don't really need anything. I just want to be in his presence. I want to be a first worshiper. I want that to be the first part of my day. And the, the middle part of my day. Hey, why not the whole day? I can, I, can, I can have this attitude of gratitude and this attitude of prayer and worship and be in his presence. I had a man ask me one time, he invited me into this Friday night thing, and um, they'd made it known, and, and, and the place was packed, and, and um, I walked in, and as soon as they introduced me, the anointing fell in the room, and we started seeing supernatural things going on, and the man called me to a private place, and he said, how do you turn it on and off like that? He said, as soon as you walked in the room, every, how do you turn it on 
teach me how to turn. And I said, that's the problem. Number one, I can't teach it. Number two, I never turn it off. I don't know how. I'm, li I'm living in this thing. And his presence agitates the demons in people. There'll be people leave your life because they don't like how they feel when you're close. Because his presence agitates their demons. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. You need to celebrate two kinds of people. Some when they come into your life, others when they leave. I just dropped some 411 right there. Y'all just need to be clapping and bouncing off the ceiling right now. You're feeling guilty because you're glad they left. God's like, now will you f finally walk in the fullness of a thing? Just be healed? Do you know we're not human doings? We're human beings. And we're spirit beings having a human encounter, not a human being having a spiritual one. We came from him. And the reason why we're here is because we're on assignment for the kingdom. And we came to take over the place. I am light and salt in this world. Jesus said I was. Amen. And, and I, I, no longer, I no longer consider it a, a, a challenge to walk into a dark place every day. I just wish God would give me another job. I just hate it here. It's so dark and demonic. Maybe you're the, maybe you're the kingdom conduit that God sent there to light the place up. Because if you take on this attitude, everything you do in word and deed, you do as unto the Lord. Even when they mess your order up at McDonald's, you won't be flipping them off and cussing them out. You'll just go get it right and say, you know what, I'm glad you got to deal with me. Because if it had been somebody else, they may have gotten upset. Take it over to Burger King. They'll just resell it. So what am I, what am I saying? What am I saying? The would-be king, David, somewhere in the process from the, appointing to the, from the anointing to the appointing, the would-be king handled the demonic manifestation for all to see. Fast forward to Jesus, our would-be king, king of kings, lord of lords. Are you a king? You've said so. <laughs> but handle everything and wipe out every strategy the adversary has set up against you. The would-be kings. Isn't this good? And every one of you in this place has been anointed to do a thing. If your appointment hasn't shown up yet, Get ready for some lions and some bears. They're coming. It doesn't change the anointing. You grow in it. You mature in it. The process. I'm going to leave you with this. Favor lives at the intersection of preparation and opportunity. David fought a bear and he fought a lion. And he said, you know what? There ain't a giant in the land that can override. I'm ready. Don't put your armor on me. I've got to move. I'm anointed to do a thing. I've been spending time in the word. And the weapons that he gave me have been mixed in with this word. And I'm going to go handle my giants in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't. You don't approach it from a spirit of fear. You approach it from the spirit of victory in which you already have. Victory's not coming. It's already yours. It's already yours. I'm telling you. Isn't this powerful? And when the anointing comes, when God uses you to do a great thing, people in position will always seek to take you out. Because jealousy is a real thing. As soon as David got a little more famous than Saul, the demons started manifesting in Saul. And he was like, send for David. I need him to come play and sing. Sometimes I felt like David. Walking into Saul's place, who's demon-possessed, 
But there, see, when there's an anointing on your life, even the demons that was tormenting Saul had to leave him alone. Why? Because David walked in the room. <laughs> this is so good. All you got to do is walk in. <laughs> huh. Y'all see this? Is this good? Praise God. Ralph, would you come? I'm going to do something spiritual. I'm just going to ask you to say yes to Jesus. Just say yes. Just say yes. I mean, in every area of your life, even right now, if, if, if you think you're dealing with some disappointments and some separations and some, and, some, and some stuff in your world that you really can't quite understand, all you're hearing is the adversary yelling and screaming and raising all kinds of ruckus in your world. And I want you to know that if the adversary is creating confusion, your breakthrough is, is very, very close. Right now in this room, I just cancel the assignment of the adversary off of your life, out of your health, out of your relationships, out of your children, out of your finances. I cancel that adversary out of there, and I replace it in the name of Jesus with peace, joy, love, Abundance, favor, promotion, healing, deliverance, in Jesus' name. Just say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus.